Hi, I'm Josh Van and I'm UDOT's project manager for the Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS. And we have some exciting news to share with everybody today. After nearly three years of analysis, we're releasing our draft EIS. And you can either download this from our website or it will be available as a hard copy at select locations around the valley. Also, the 45-day comment period begins today. And I hope everybody takes some time to review the document and submit comments. I'd also like to send a big thank you to all of our cooperating agencies. These are the Utah Transit Authority, Salt Lake City Public Utilities, the Forest Service, the EPA, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Specialists from these cooperating agencies spent significant time reviewing our document and ensuring that it's both complete and accurate before released. And I'm confident that we have a better document because of their efforts, so thank you. Included in the draft is the preferred alternative for both the primary alternative and the sub-alternatives, and that's what we'll spend a majority of the time focusing in on today. So let's do a quick review. Over the course of the project, we evaluated 124 different concepts and through the two-stage screening process, we brought that down to five alternatives that move forward into the draft EIS. First and foremost, I want to remind everyone that the evaluation of the alternatives was a data-driven process that was really informed by all the public comments we've received to date. And to identify the preferred alternative, UDOT considered an alternative's ability to meet the project's purpose and need and an alternative's associated resource impact. So this is water quality, air quality, environmental justice, and the roughly 20 other resources that were analyzed. The project's purpose and need is to substantially improve transportation-related safety, reliability, and mobility on SR210 from Fort Union Boulevard through the town of Alta for all users. So let's break those three criteria down individually. Number one, safety. Safety is a component in everything UDOT does, and in this project, safety is primarily related to both avalanche mitigation and trailhead slash roadside parking for both vehicles and pedestrians. The second one is mobility, and mobility is really a measure of congestion. And in this case, it's substantially reducing the estimated 80 to 85 minute travel time in design year of 2050, and reducing the queuing on Wasatch and 9400 South that are literally projected to be miles long. But the second part of the mobility goal is to address the weekday afternoon commute congestion that's expected to worsen on Wasatch by 45% in the design year. The third goal is reliability. And as UDOT defines it, reliability is really a consistent travel time. And knowing that if it normally takes you 30 minutes to get up the canyon, that'll take you 30 minutes today. While all the alternatives substantially improve safety, it's really the last two goals, mobility and reliability, that the alternatives solve to a lesser or greater degree relatively. And that's why we've identified two options for consideration to be the preferred alternative, so we can gain additional public feedback on these alternatives. Just to be clear, in the final EIS, UDOT will identify a single preferred alternative. But by selecting two alternatives at the draft stage that differ in alignment, impacts, and mode, this provides the public an opportunity to focus their review and comment on the differing considerations. Based on the technical analysis conducted by the project team and the cooperating agency's peer review of our analysis, UDOT has identified two options. The first is the enhanced bus service in peak period shoulder lanes, as this is the alternative that best meets the mobility goal. The second option is gondola alternative B, as this is the alternative that best meets the reliability goal. So these are the two options for the preferred alternative that are in the draft EIS. And these two alternatives were selected as they meet the project purpose in different ways, while considering environmental impacts in comparison to the other three alternatives. So let's take a closer look at each of these. UDOT selected the enhanced bus service and peak period shoulder lane alternative as it provides the best overall mobility of the five alternatives, and that's because it provides the lowest overall travel time. And this is because shoulder running buses 
would remove transit users from the general traffic lanes and the associated traffic congestion, and it might actually allow the buses to pass slower moving vehicles in the general purpose lane. A quick review of the alternative, a transit user seat time would be approximately 36 minutes from the gravel pit hub up to Alta, and this includes 12 minutes to enter the mobility hub, find a spot, grab your gear, and walk over to the bus platform, then 24 minutes on the bus up to Alta. There would be two mobility hubs, one at the gravel pit and the other at 9400 South and Highland, and a bus would depart each mobility hub every five minutes in the peak period with direct service to each resort meaning the Alta bus would not stop at Snowbird and the Snowbird bus would not continue up to Alta. This alternative has a capital cost of 510 million and a winter operations and maintenance costs of $11 million per year. As you may have heard UTA say before, the two factors that attract potential transit users are the speed of the service, AKA reduced seat time, and the frequency of the service to reduce that fear of missing the next bus. Like I mentioned before, the enhanced bus has the fastest seat time of the five alternatives, and this is why it meets the mobility component the best. Cost is of course a consideration as it relates to how well an alternative accomplishes the purpose and need, and the peak period shoulder lanes has the second lowest initial cost. Also, the wider shoulders would increase safety for both pedestrians and cyclists by allowing them to travel farther away from vehicles in the general purpose lanes, adding a little safety buffer. The widened shoulders are less visually impactful than the gondola towers, but they do increase the hard surface area, which is important for water quality impacts. But also the road is now just wider, which affects wildlife habitat. I think it's important to recognize that travel times listed are calculated based on dry pavement. And it's when it's snowing hard in the canyon that these travel times are likely to go up, and the buses are prone to delays associated with slide-offs and crashes. So while there will be more area to, remove, to maneuver around these incidents than there is today, delays are still possible with this option. UDOT selected Gondola Alternative B. This is the gondola alternative with the base station from Lakai, as it best meets the reliability component of the project's purpose and need. And that's because it operates in an aerial alignment independent of SR210, which allows it to avoid delays related to avalanche mitigation, snow removal, vehicular traffic, and also those crashes and incidents. So a quick review of this alternative. The transit user's seat time will vary depending on if you park at the parking structure at the base or at one of the two mobility hubs. So it would take either 55 or 59 minutes up to Alta, which includes that same 12 minutes to enter the mobility hub, find a spot, grab your gear, and walk to the bus or gondola platform, and then 37 minutes on the gondola up to Alta. And this is a 19 minute increase during times of dry pavement versus the peak period shoulder lane option. Again, there are two mobility hubs in this alternative, albeit smaller. One is at the gravel pit and the other is at 94 South and Highland, along with a parking structure for 1500 vehicles at the gondola base station. So this would result in the gravel pit holding 600 vehicles and the 9400 South and Highland station having a capacity of 400 vehicles. Each gondola would hold approximately 35 passengers and a new cabin would arrive every two minutes. This alternative has a capital cost of 592 million and a winter operations and maintenance cost of 7.6 million per year. So the gondola does have a higher initial investment cost of $82 million, but with the O&M costs, being $3.4 million less per year than the peak period shoulder lane, over the 30 year life cycle, the costs are roughly the same. The fact that the gondola operates in an aerial alignment separate from the roadway is its main strength and why it meets the reliability component of the purpose and need the best. Also, the 1500 stalls at the base station lowers the seat time for potential riders and requires fewer mode shifts. And a mode shift is when you have to transfer from your car to a bus or a bus to a gondola, 
and is sometimes seen as a deterrent to potential riders. The gondola does have the second highest initial, co initial construction cost, however, and the gondola does have the highest visual impacts, but it does have lower impacts to the watershed, wildlife, and the climbing boulders than the other alternatives, because the only ground-disturbing activities would be at the tower locations, rather than the need to widen the roadway shoulders for the full length of the canyon. For the sub-alternative components, UDOT evaluated each of these additional improvements as they help the primary alternative achieve the project's goals, so let's go through each of these individually. For the Mobility Hub, UDOT selected the Gravel Pit and 9400 South Highland Drive as the location for the Mobility Hubs. Both Mobility Hubs will be included as part of the preferred alternative. And like I mentioned before, under the PPSL bus option, there will be 1,500 and 1,000 stalls respectively. And under the Gondola B alternative, this would be reduced to 600 and 400 stalls respectively at these two locations. With regard to Wasatch Boulevard, UDOT selected the five-lane alternative as it provides better transportation performance for all segments and directions of Wasatch Boulevard. But UDOT heard the concerns of the residents and plans to implement a phased approach of this sub-alternative by first constructing the imbalanced lane alternative, but purchasing the right-of-way to accommodate the five-lane alternative in the future if the level of service becomes unacceptable at some point. And this extra right-of-way would be maintained as open space during this time on the east side of the road between the travel lane and the multi-use trail, essentially offering a little more buffer to trail users. For the snow sheds option, UDOT chose snow sheds with the realigned road avalanche mitigation alternative, as this is it has less visual impact and ground disturbance because it doesn't have the berms. If you remember, the berms were roughly 300 feet long, 50 feet wide at the base, and 20 feet tall, and would extend uphill. Because the berms essentially funnel the avalanche debris, realigning the road is more expensive because the snow sheds will have to be longer than the berms alternative. But UDOT believes that the lesser visual impacts outweigh this greater cost. For the trailhead improvements sub-alternative, UDOT chose to complete the trailhead improvements at four locations. This is White Pine, Lisa Falls, The Bridge, and Gate Buttress. And also implement no roadside parking within a quarter mile of these four trailheads that are being improved. And the reason UDOT chose this alternative is because it does not substantially reduce recreation access in areas that are currently used but don't have designated parking areas. For the no winter parking alternative, UDOT chose to remove winter roadside parking, which would improve overall mobility by reducing friction between parked vehicles and pedestrians, and also improving winter snow removal operations. And as a reminder, this only applies above entry one. Also, for all of the primary alternatives, tolling or single occupancy restrictions are being considered as well. The draft EIS is being released today, June 25th, and that begins the 45-day public review and comment period. And we sincerely hope you take some time to review the materials and submit comments on the alternatives, as well as the environmental impacts associated with each of them and also how they meet the purpose and need for the project, so the safety, mobility, and any reliability considerations. A quick reminder about comments. Commenting on the draft is not a vote on an alternative or an action, but it's really an opportunity for the public to provide the project team with input regarding the environmental analysis that was performed or any other factor that UDOT should consider in making a final decision. Formal comments will be accepted through a number of channels. You can either email us, you can submit them through the website, you can leave us a voicemail, or even a written letter. And of course, there will be an opportunity at the upcoming public hearings. UDOT has two public hearings scheduled. The first will be in person on July 13th at Butler Middle School and will also include an open house. 
And then the second hearing will be a week later on July 20th, and this will be a virtual event so we can gain additional feedback from members of the public who may not be able to attend the hearing on the 13th. For more details on the two public hearings, you can find the participant guides on our website, so please take a moment to review these also. Moving forward, so UDOT will review and respond to both public and agency comments that we received during that 45-day comment period and revise the draft EIS based on this input received. The final EIS will identify a single preferred alternative that best meets the project purpose and need. And when determining the single preferred alternative for the final EIS, UDOT will take into consideration how each alternative compares relatively with regards to environmental impacts, which best meets the EIS's purpose and need, which best meets UDOT's mission and responsibilities, and of course, public input considerations that we receive from the draft EIS. We hope to release the final EIS and the record of decision in the winter of 21-22, or a little less than a year out. As a reminder, you can review all of our previously released documents on our website, including the five-part podcast series where we dig deeper into each of the alternatives. And I sincerely hope you take some time to review the draft and provide comment to the team. So thank you for taking the time today and throughout the NEPA process, and I hope this video was helpful. I look forward to meeting with everyone at the two planned public hearings in July.